John Mara. Uh, my full-time job is that I'm an agency professional. I'm an old school entrepreneur. I started my company 12 years back. This all in Silicon Valley. And so uh, it's an ad firm. And uh, this is my office. Uh, and uh, we've been in the market for a long time. And uh, my firm deals with like international culture. So we work with brands typically. We enable them to uh, market from the case strategies so they grow within uh, diverse segments uh, within the US, largely within North America. That's my full time job. And then I have a lot of initiatives I do. And one of those is smart setups. Uh, how this came about was uh, simple. Uh, about a couple of years back, we had these uh, like really firms from like Israel, Holland, and you know, specific you know countries. Uh, if I remember, uh, British even you know they they were reaching out to us, Brazil. Uh, you know, you guys, you know, if you guys help us to you know transition in Silicon Valley, and then we we don't do that. We don't typically work with startups, and but we came up with the idea. Okay, we can't serve them that way, but we can at least launch an initiative because we already have that background working with different cultures. So we launched this initiative and it's been growing. We have about 1,500 members from 100 plus countries uh, spread all over the world, really, and it continues to grow. Uh, right now it's a very uh, uh, local, regional uh, platform, uh, which is like we meet uh, two or three times a month in uh, San Francisco uh, through events like this. We typically have more uh, uh, attendees about 40 on an average, I would say. Uh, but sometimes it don't you know, you, you've seen it, you've been there a few times. It's <laughs> So it varies. Uh, I, and also, for some of you, from, if you are familiar, there's a Chinese New Year, actually. This is the last year of the year. And a lot of people actually, they have, uh, they get together with families, and uh, it's a big day, you know. Uh, you, you've got to be seeing Chinatown all decked up, you know, so it's, it's a big Asian community, uh, right? Chinese and Vietnamese and Vietnamese. The, the parade is Saturday, right? Parade, yeah, on the weekend, you know, that'll be happening, but a lot of stuff happens around that. So that's it. And uh, my, what, what, what uh, I love bringing, you know, I, I try to find good speakers in, uh, with international background and, uh, and with an interesting story. And I do search and I try to, you know, uh, network and find people and uh, some people who have a story to share, and uh, uh, excuse me if I don't say it right. I I B. I I B. It's it's beautiful. Uh, so I, I found out about I B, and actually the first time I found out about love and food, I was selling here. Was my wife? Uh, she's a culinary professional, and she was attending an event, a culinary event actually in Stanford. And I took to it. So she brought with me, she brought actually a box because you guys were giving away the box at that time. Yeah. Um, and uh, and we were pretty intrigued by the concept. Wow. Okay. Because we got kids, and we were always looking for like snacks, and I know these snacks, and going to Whole Foods and just randomly picking up stuff. Okay. But you, every time you can't go and you can't just pick up. So somebody curated that for you and sending it to you, and then you taking a decision to buy what you like, what kids like. Yeah. So it was cool. And I didn't knew that at that time, and so now, and now, now we know. So I found Ivy, and uh, I was very intrigued by her story. Uh, she mentioned some of it on our website, and uh, but I thought, you know, it's good to bring together to you know you guys. You, know, you guys are uh, professionals and entrepreneurs in your own right, and, and you could be the next Ivy, and even much bigger, and Mark Zuckerberg, whatever you're envisioning. So it's good too. My my goal is to bring you uh, uh, people who are interesting stories and background and just to come and talk about how they did it so you could learn from it you know because they're going to be talking they're, they're going to be sharing a lot about well, how they did it and uh, this is Silicon Valley guys you know uh, you know like Hollywood you know, dreams do come true here for, for a lot of startups and big things happen if there's any place this is it so I hope we know she, uh, I be uh, I'm really excited to have her here I really appreciate you coming well, thank you my buddy yeah. thank you and, uh, One, but feel free to ask questions. You know, it's uh, you know, I think you know we all are 
uh, I would love to have a startup of my own at some point, a new startup, not a 12 year old startup. Uh, you know, things like that. So I would love, I learn from uh, people like me also, you know. Uh, so welcome, and um, uh, so yeah, please, let's uh, let's get started. And so you can ask Q&A at the end, and uh, we open it up, and it's all to you now. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, thanks for inviting me, and thanks for coming on Wednesday night, and happy Chinese New Year. Uh, so, just a raise of hands, how many of you are founders? Okay, how many of you uh, want to be founders? Okay, and the rest of you came from the Pepsi? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, as Thomas said, my name is Ivy, just remember I am uh, I, I guess I fit the foreign startup team because I'm a foreigner. Um, I'm originally from Singapore. I moved to the U.S. Uh, right before Y2K. Uh, some of you might not be old enough to remember what Y2K is. <laughs> 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 99, 98. Uh, so I was working uh, in Singapore as a financial software engineer. So my major is computer science and finance. So I was happily working in Singapore, uh, implementing huge financial system to get all the banks you know, moved to at that time it was client server system, the sexy word. Um, see, I'm dating myself. Um, and uh, and moving everyone away from mainframe because Y2K is coming. Um, and then I got um, a call actually from a company in the US here who actually offered me a job saying that they needed my skill to help to move a lot of the mainframe systems to you know the big enterprise system like uh, at that time it was people uh, and I kind of ignored it, and then I got another call from another U.S. company. So at the end of the day, I had I was um, offered seven jobs in the U.S. Uh, and I was, you know, young, early twenties, poor. I'm like, what's what's the worst case if I move to the U.S. and if it doesn't, um, you know, if it doesn't turn out well? The worst case is I can always move back to Singapore. Singapore's not that bad, you know. Um, so I decided to move here. Um, even though I spoke English, I didn't know how to drive on the right hand side of the road. <laughs> um, I grew up with British English, so a lot of words I had to switch. You know, people don't know what cutlery here is, or the boot of the car, no one knows what's the boot of the car. Um, and I came here to work for the final the, uh, company that actually uh, moved me here was uh, Anderson Consulting, which is now known as Accenture. So I, I, I uh, was with them for a while, and being a consultant there, I got to uh, lived in different parts of the U.S. Uh, I lived in Washington D.C. I lived in Orange County. I lived in Las Vegas, uh, Detroit, Michigan, um, Seattle, and Silicon Valley. So it's been a very exciting journey for my set first uh, seven years in the U.S. because I was doing enterprise consulting. I was moving to wherever the client was. I have no family here, um, so it was very. I was very mobile, uh, and it was very adventurous for me, given you know I'm a foreigner. Uh, going to Michigan, from Michigan to California is world of difference. It's two different countries. It shouldn't be called the United States. It's two different countries. Um, so that was that was exciting, and then um, it was very comfortable lifestyle. You know, being a, a financial software engineer, no complaints. But then I hit midlife crisis. I decided I got tired of what I was doing. Um, you know, finance and computer science is not the most sexy thing to do and not the most fun thing to do because counting other people's money is really very boring. Um, especially, you know, you can't lose a penny. Uh, and at that time, I was going through a very hot uh, uh, period in my life. Looking back, if I was, I was truly happy. Um, and was I making a difference? You know, I know I have a bucket list of things that I wanted to do. I wanted to travel. I wanted to start a company. Um, I wanted to go skydiving. You know, there are a lot of things that I look back. I felt like in my twenties, it was adventurous. I moved to a different continent, but I haven't gone through my bucket list of things I wanted to do. Um, and and unfortunately, my ex-husband and I decided to split. Um, I lost half of my assets uh, because he wasn't working. And, US, it, it, everything is fair and square. So I thought at that moment, uh, it was a great time to reboot my life. So I broke up my marriage, lost half of my assets, and I 
put everything in Silicon Valley, and I went to the airport with a backpack. With just one backpack and a, a one-way ticket um, to London. And I spent the next one year pack backpacking around the world, uh, not knowing what I wanted to do, but wanting to know that I wanted to live my life. Because I know I, I, the first eight years of my career, I didn't get the chance to travel around, which I really wanted to. <coughs> So I went to a lot of places like you know Western Europe, went to Romania, Bulgaria, went to Egypt, went to Turkey, went to China, went to uh, Thailand, then went down you know Asia, went back to Singapore to see my family. And after a year I got bored, you know, I get bored really easily. Um, so I decided that you know, it was time to come back here. Uh, at that time I it took me a year to decide to come back to Silicon Valley because you know given that I I've, I've grown up uh, in Singapore, um, I did my master's in London, and then I lived in the U.S. So I pretty much can live anywhere. Um, and but it was actually in Egypt that I took up a U.S. dollar because I take the U.S. dollar. I'm like, wow, I haven't seen the U.S. dollar for a long time. I really miss it. That was the moment that I thought, okay, you know, I Silicon Valley is where I belong. So I decided. To um, so I came back here, I was jobless, didn't know what to do, but I knew that I didn't want to go back to my original uh, career, what I was doing. Um, money was great, but I just couldn't do it in my financial system anymore. Um, so I decided to help a friend at Farmer's Market to sell food, since I was jobless and bored. Uh, and that was when I realized that, wow, the food business is damn hard. And I asked her, why are you not at Whole Foods or Safeway? And then she explained to me that, you know, that there's only so much shelf space in Whole Foods, right? Um, and most of the shelf space is reserved for big brands. So if you're an up and coming brand, you're medium sized, there's no way Whole Foods or trade, uh, not trade, Safeway will actually give you space. If they give you space, they'll give you at the bottom, right? And getting your product into the into grocery store is actually a very long and complicated process. And for me, I'm like, wow, I love to eat. Why is this so difficult just to discover interesting products like, like yours? You know what, if I didn't live near a farmer's market, I would have never discovered all these intriguing products, right? So I got angry. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what can I do to change the whole food system in the US? Um, you know, so I thought, okay, what I know is technology, right? And I can build stuff on the internet. So I decided to learn Ruby on Rails. Uh, at that time, you know, Ruby on Rails was like the hardest la language. Um, I learned Ruby on Rails. I talked to a lot of food companies to ask them what pain points they have. And I built a system basically, my main goal was to help food companies get their, you know, food easily discovered. And for consumers like me to discover interesting products that I don't have to depend on walking into, you know, Safeway and Whole Foods and those selections are actually chosen by you by the buyer, uh, chosen for you by the buyer. So, so that was how Love With Food started. Um, and, and I was very excited, you know, that I was coding again, because I thought I'd never code again. Uh, it was fun, and didn't know what I was doing. I don't know anything about the food industry, so I talked to a lot of people, which I'm very thankful to till today that a lot of food companies at Farmer's Market actually helped me along the way. They gave me ideas of what to build. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm a solo founder. Uh, until today, the company's been three years. Um, I don't have a, a founder. And, and um, I built it. I got a lot of, uh, oh my God, at that time in 2011, late 2011, I launched it. Uh, I launched the site. People were using the site. I, got, I was making some money, you know, and the Facebook page to about 60,000 fans. I was, you know, doing, I was like social media and customer support and engineer and janitor all at once. Um, and then a friend of mine just said, hey, why don't you pitch to fund your startups? At that time, I had no clue what fundraising was. I hear about it, I go to a lot of events like this, but I've never done it before. Um, and that was late 2011. So I said, okay, sure. And at that time, 500 startup is, there's no application process. It's all by referral. Um, you need to get at least three people who know 500 to refer you in. So, so I'm very shameless, right? So I, I started hanging out at 500 startups. <laughs> um, they're very welcoming. At that time, the doors are wide open. 
they didn't have, they have no locks. They have locks now to avoid you know people like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I I had some friends there and they referred me and uh, it was a Friday that I pitched to one of the partners at Five Hundred and I showed him the site. Um, and at that time, Liquid Food was the model was the Groupon from Gourmet Snacks, okay? Because 2011, there was Groupon for everything, right? Um, and I pitched him and I said, okay, this is, this is how I build, you know, this is the problem I'm solving, and this is our Facebook page, we got a lot of fans. Then they were shocked, they were like, so how about you sell tea? And I'm like, me? <laughs> <laughs> so they said, how is it possible that you coded the site, you know, did the design, and um, you know, we grew the Facebook page, and, and at that time Twitter, had, we had about 5,000 um, followers. And I basically just told them, you want to know my secrets, you have to find me. Then I'll share, you, I'll share my secrets with you and the rest of the companies that <laughs> you accepted. And they were shocked. And that was Friday, right? Um, they said, okay, let us give, give us a few days to think about it. You sure? On Monday morning, they said, okay, we want you in. Now tell us the secret. <laughs> Um, so that was how uh, I raised the first fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, and over time, the Groupon model didn't work um, because when it comes to food, people really need to experience it before they make a purchasing decision. Especially when liquid food represents companies that are organic, all natural, non-GMO, gluten-free. These snacks are not as cheap as ladies or Oreos, you know. So when it comes to trying all these products, people needed to have a sample before they make a purchasing decision. Um, so what Love With Food today is, as you guys know, is a, a subscription service to the consumer where you pay $10 a month to get a surprise snack every month. You know, people call our red box um, Christmas every month. But what's more important is the business itself is actually how it serves the food company, it, it has become a, a, a new way to do sampling because we have reduced the cost and uh, the cost of sampling for food companies. And so what we do is we ask the food companies, you don't do the sampling at Whole Foods or Costco, you give the samples to us, we'll distribute nationwide. And at the same time, we'll collect consumer insights for you. So after you taste the product, we'll actually ask you, hey, is the packaging easy to open? Is is the product, you know, the labeling of the product, when you taste it, did it deliver that promise? So we, we, we have, so essentially the company has evolved into a marketing and consumer insights platform for CPG food brands all across the country. And, uh, and we have a great relationship with a lot of food companies. Um, and consumers like it too, because you know, at $10 a month is fine, it's not an expensive uh, hobby. Um, it's a great way to discover new snacks because a lot of our customers are actually in rural America. To them, what is healthy is like 40 minutes drive to Target, uh, which a lot of people, you know, it's not like us, but spoiled here. Uh, a lot of people who are not quite in the suburbs of rural America, they really appreciate uh, what, what we do by like bringing uh, unique products into their door. They try it, if they love it, they can always come back to the website to buy the more what they love. And, uh, and it's a great service for moms. Moms love us because, you know, kids are very picky eaters, right? You don't want to buy a bag of really healthy cookies for $10 and the kids don't eat it and you have to trash it. So this, the, the way we have done it is a great way for moms to, one, they save time to the hunt, hunt, and two, um, they, they can test out what their kids like and don't like. If the kids don't like, if they toss it, it's not too much waste of money. So that's what Love With Food is today. Um, and I told you about the, 15, the first 50,000 that I raised. And then following after 500 startups, I went up to raise another 650,000 from um, angels and a couple of VCs in the valley. Uh, at the, the first round of funding, the 650 was the biggest hurdle that I, I faced was I was a single, uh, a solo founder. Uh, because it gives people a moment of pause because uh, it is true, it is hard. I'm not going to say it is, it is easy. It, every day is a challenge and it's very challenging for just one person, you know, battling uh, everything, battling fire 24 7. So it, 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 it does give uh, investors a moment of pause. Um, 
but I still managed to raise that money. And then a year and a half later, I raised another one point four million. So in total, I raised more than two million dollars. And the team right now has grown from myself to fifteen people. Um, so it's been a long journey, uh, not easy, but I'm glad that I hit midlife crisis and just mm -hmm. and had the chance to do what I love. So what do they get for ten dollars? Like five samples? Uh, no, they get about eight to ten different samples uh, once a month. Eight to ten? That's a yeah. lot. Yeah, and uh, and also uh, there's oh, and one thing I, I forgot to mention is uh, when I started uh, when I decided to start a company, I to me is you know it, it needs to have a giving back component. I regardless of what company I start. Um, so when I started looking food. I made a mission that you know, for every sale that we make, we'll donate a meal to feed every child in the U.S. Uh, because you know, while traveling a lot around the world, I realized that there were really a lot of uh, fortunate kids out there, and it's actually happening here in our backyard. It's just people don't talk about it. Um, then quiz you: Do you know how one in how many kids go to bed hungry in the U.S.? One out of three. Thirty. Yeah. One in three. One in three. Six. One in five. Wow. That's 20%. Yeah. And that's that's usually, you know, the media doesn't talk about it. And uh, that's really sad. I think the face of hunger here is very different from, like, you know, in Africa where there's famine, really scrawny. But the face of hunger here is, yeah, I used to go to school. But I actually go to bed hungry, but nobody knows. Um, so I made a mission that, you know, we want to help change that number. That's why Love With Food stands for helping you to find Love With Food at the same time shower your Love With Food because while you're enjoying your snacks, you know that you're doing good too. So how do you locate these kids and send them snacks? Or we don't send them snacks, we, we give money. So we work with food banks all across the country. So in three years, we have donated more than 400,000 meals all across the country. Oh, to food banks. They can buy purchasing power because one dollar they can turn it into six meals or eight meals depending on which food bank you get to. Yeah. So many receipts in your company. Do you still have the last word in your company and do you plan to sell sale? No, I still have the last word. Yeah. I think I'm fortunate that I have a really good group of investors that they don't care what to do. they leave me alone. And they know I got pissed if they tell me what to do. Because they don't know the business as well as so, um, and it's, it's good to have investors who have been entrepreneurs before. Yeah. So, do you guys remember homestead.com back in the 90s? Uh, the founder is Justin Kitch, um, and he's an investor. So, he has gone through what, I've got, what I'm going through, you know. Um, and he's not only a great investor, he's also a great mentor for me because there will be times, there will be a lot of times, that I'll reach a point where I don't know what to do. I'll call him. I'll call. I'll call some of our very close investors. Say, hey, I have this problem. What should I do? They don't tell me what to do. They know that it's not right for them to tell me what to do. But they'll tell me, oh, you know, this same thing happened to me so many years ago. This is what I did. You know, and and listening to the experiences of entrepreneurs who have been there, done that, it. 
it helped me get a resolution myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many of you have mentors? You, the rest of you need to. <laughs> I was wondering about your revenue streams. Uh, now you have probably the, obviously the revenues from people buying the subscription, right. but do you also charge the companies for the data that you're providing them? Yes, we do. And is that your main revenue stream? Uh, right now I would say half and half. Oh. Yeah, because we needed to get a lot of consumers to sign up to make it interesting to the food companies. You know, mm -hmm. if we tell the food companies, hey, we can send out <laughs> samples to 100 members, yeah. they are like, no way, we can do that at Costco ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. But if you tell them we have thousands and thousands of female demographic, yeah. do you want to do business with us? Yeah. Then they're like, oh yeah. Um, so so the brands part, we didn't try right in the beginning. We only started charging sometime in the last year, once we got to a critical max. And do you sell them just their data or also general data from what you're gathering from the other brands? Too? Right now it's just their data. Yeah, we don't, um, we, have, we haven't done the aggregate data yeah. yet, but we, we will. Yeah. Can you, could you talk a bit more about customer acquisition? Because it seems like that's really important, right? For yes. the two to become, get to critical mass. So I guess it's like a balance, right? Do you have enough products for people to sign up? And if you have enough people that brands get? Yeah. Uh, I'm amazed that every month we have to do projections and we we'll do projections like three months out. There will be situations that we over project, under project. Uh, so I've been I'm in charge of user acquisition uh, up until half a year ago. We never had an online marketing person so I've been just doing a lot of pushing whether it's paid or organic. Um, so in the beginning when I started business, I don't know who's the ideal audience. Right? So I just wrote to a lot of bloggers, hey, do you want to try a box, a free box for your review? Um, that was how, I can honestly tell you bloggers are the one that launched our company. Sorry. Bloggers. Oh. It was the bloggers here that started to get our box, they started to talk about it, and everyone started to get interested um, that actually helped. So, the, uh, so that's when I started to observe the pattern, like who are the people who actually sign up uh, for Love the Food, and then we realized they are women. Yeah, of 25 and above, you know, you're not like 18, 19 year old, you're 25 and above. And um, interesting enough, half of the women are single, the other half are parents. And both have very different motivation. You know, single women is, I work so hard, I want to give for myself every month $10, yeah, no big deal. You know, for moms is, oh, it's a great way for me to fit healthy snacks to my kids. So when we found out there's two different different demographics, as the company grow, right? Uh, then when we invest in paid marketing, we realize that you know what are the different channels we have to target, and the messaging for the two different groups of uh, women. How was the fundraising process? Painful. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I actually wrote a blog about how I raised the six, the first six hundred and fifty thousand. Someone posted on Hacker News and went viral. Um, it was it was tough. I think uh, I have a lot of cheerleaders because you know when I think a lot of people sympathize that I'm a solo founder. I have to run the company. In class, I have to fundraise. Fundraising is a full time job, um, and it's very very chaotic when I'm fundraising and running the company at the same time. But I have a great team. Who um, but it was, especially raising the first 650, it was my really truly first time going out to pitch to uh, people that I don't know. And I'm like, hey, I don't know you, you want to give me a hundred grand? Um, it was a great learning experience. It, it plays with your mind psychologically after, you know, so many no's, I'm like, okay, I'm a loser, you know. But you just have to keep on telling yourself you can do it, keep on going. The first round, it took me about four months, two, three to four months to close the round. Mm -hmm. The first check came in um, from this investor who is a partner at Blue Run Ventures. So, um, so the money, the, the money that he wrote is from his personal money. It's not Blue Run Ventures. So he basically saw me walking around in my t-shirt, and you know I have a very hard to pronounce name, right? So he just said, "Hey, love with food," <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I turned around like, "Who the hell is calling me love with food?" 
Um, and he he said, I've been following your company. I read about it on TechCrunch. And at that time, the company is only about four months old. Um, what what does the G shirt say? My T shirt says Liquid Food. My oh, company. Okay. Oh, your company. Yeah. So he's like, I'm really, I'm really intrigued. Um, I really want I want to speak to, speak more to you uh, about your company, and I know you're fundraising. And he's like, here's my card, and here's my assistant's email. She was ahead of the time. So in two days, I met him, and I explained to him my vision, how the company is. And the next day, he wrote me a twenty-five thousand dollars check. So it's good to wear your t-shirts. Wear your t-shirts. They say that t-shirts are San Francisco's business cards. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, it is. And that was how I got Andrew Zimmerman to endorse our product too. You know, Andrew Zimmerman, the guy from Bazaar Foods, um, on what network? I don't know what network is that. He eats like, yeah, he eats bugs and. So I I was talking to him online and I found out where his office was in Minneapolis. So we just I just kept on sending him the boxes. I didn't hear back. My feelings were hurt, but we just kept on sending him boxes. And I was at New York Food Festival. I was wearing my T-shirt. And he came up to me and he said, "This company has been sending me snacks." <laughs> and I said, "I'm the founder. I'm the one sending you snacks." And and I said, "Hey, I really I really love um, what you do. Your adventures, you know. And don't you like our concept of you know discovering new food every month? It's sort of like his theme, right? Discovering." Uh, I said we'd love to do something together, and he gave me his email, his assistant's email, and then we, we, and he agreed to work with us for free. Nice. At that time, I told, I was very honest with him. I said, I'm a startup, we can't afford to pay you, but what we can do is we can donate to the food bank of choice. And he's like, sure, deal, let's do it. And that's when I, I was very, I was very humble, and he was very excited. And I'm like, wow, I got a celebrity to work with us, you know, and and of course at that time I'm like, I'm a foreigner with a weird name, you know, um, so anything is possible, anything, as long as you're shameless, and wear your t-shirt, um, and, uh, and I read about him and he was actually homeless for a while, so he understands the social mission of the company, yeah, did you guys know that he was a drug addict before, yeah, he was a drug addict, and he was going in and out of prison, and when he got out, he was homeless, was the homeless shelter that turned him around. Yeah. So he has a really good heart. Yeah. So how do you use your data to do your marketing? I mean, now that you're a slightly bigger company, uh -huh. coming from one person, how do you do your marketing probably? Have you involved that? In acquisition? Yes, getting new customers. Right. So we're very strong on Facebook. Uh, we're very strong on social media. Uh, that's that was how we started, and um, and I mean, you know, for me as an engineer, I'm very analytical. I need to track everything. If I'm spending twenty grand here, I need to be able to know what the CPA is as a return on ad spend. Yep. Um, so and anything online is trackable, you know. Uh, so that's where I always tell my team: you want to spend, spend on online because it gives me a comfort feeling that we are tracking, we're doing the right thing. So. Basically, all the social media channels we spend a lot on Facebook, uh, on YouTube. Uh, YouTube is interesting because you know I didn't grow up as a YouTube generation. You know I'm older, um, but I started to see <coughs> traffic from YouTube. So if you go on YouTube and search "love with food," there are over sixty thousand videos about us. Hmm. And I'm like, well, we didn't pay for any of the videos in the beginning. Well, I, like, why are people going? What? I was looking at Google Analytics, I'm like, why are people coming from YouTube? So I went on YouTube and I, look, people are doing the unboxing experience on YouTube. I guess people have a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was when I started to be intrigued at, at YouTube and I was like, okay, we need to spend money on YouTube because they are referring people. So we tried to do a lot of things. We tried to try to collaborate with people with a lot of subscribers on YouTube. We go to YouTube conferences to build a relationship. Um, so based on whatever GA was showing, we're like, okay, this is where we should spend. Um, so anywhere that is social media, we would social media and women, we would invest.
Uh, do you have any key focus areas in the next five years for the next eight growth? Yes. Uh, so we one, we definitely want we want to scale, grow bigger, and two, we are doing you know well with the data that we have right now, we can build a larger B two B part of the business. You know, it's not just collecting data for one company, like what we can create a service where people will pay us a monthly fee to get access to the data. Like a lot of chips company, you know, those savory snacks, that space is very competitive. Do not start the savory snacks business. <laughs> Food companies will ask us. For example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna name one company. Company A will say, okay, you have collected data for, for us. How did we do compared to these are the companies that you featured? So we don't we can share because it's confidential, but we can share a general idea because there's an index number that you know that we track, right? So one of the things that we want to build is to grow that B two B part of the business where uh, food companies can get that kind of data. So most of the money I assume is spent on shipping all that food. Oh, there is shipping. Two dollars, and that's that's enough to ship ten snacks. Uh, we we actually eat some of the cost. Oh. Yeah, we just make it simple. Two dollars, forgettable. Yeah. Once there are sound birds, there are some. Yeah. Yeah. It depends if there's a yeah. I brought some boxes there. If it's um, <laughs> <laughs> if it's if it's like a chip, it will be like a full single serving size. If it's like you know chocolate, it will be maybe one or two pieces. Yeah. And where where is your warehouse of snacks? I want to go eat them all. In North Carolina. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> so do you not even local? No, uh, we got so big that you know we had to outsource to a bigger oh. uh, logistic company. Hmm. Yeah. But your um, your team works from some the, of the, the brain stuff. is yeah. here, but it anything you do with is on the east. So you are the one who tests the snack before you put it on yes. the ice. Yes. Yeah, if you come to our office, you'll be eating a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the job. We're telling people you if you want to work at local food, you need to love to eat because every day we're testing. Because we have like right now, because we have grown, a lot of food companies want to be in the box, so they pitch to us. Then we're like, okay, send us samples, we'll taste it, then we'll decide, okay. You wouldn't imagine the number of things we have to spit out. <laughs> That's part of the job. So someone, some genius, uh, decided that to create a, you know those juice pack for kids? Yeah. You know, but he made one for adults. I can't see a man drinking a juice pack. <laughs> That's one. And two, it's supposed to be like for hikers, you know, for energy, you know, boost your energy when you're hiking. And he want to make it healthy. So he made this juice pack that boosts your energy when you're hiking, and it's kale and grapes. Kale? Kale, kale the and green grapes. vegetable, and grapes. Oh, very healthy. <laughs> So nobody's gonna buy it. But you know, sometimes it's hard to tell a food company that you know we can't feature you because no one's gonna like it. Yeah. We'll just tell them it's not a right fit for audience. It's not better. Because of the data cost. So yeah, like for example, seaweed, right? I love seaweed. Um, and people on the West Coast love seaweed. Well, we featured seaweed once. It was the worst product. <laughs> the other half of the country didn't, didn't like it. It was the worst review. And, uh, and other CB companies approached us again. We told them, you know, we're not the right platform because our audience don't like CB. You know, because we want to make sure it's a win-win for both sides too. Uh, and we showed them the data for CB. And if you still want to move ahead, then that's fine. But we tell people you, you, you're going to waste money on you know, your CB product on our audience. 
Sorry, I want to have my product feature new platform arrive you and send you a box as well for Amazon. You send a sample, you know, then we'll try, and then if it fits all our criteria. So our criteria is it has to be either organic, natural, um, not too much sugar. <laughs> uh, yeah, not too much. Um, sugar is fine, but as long as natural sugar, um, and it cannot have artificial flavoring or coloring. Yeah. So it's junk free snacks. So you have to fit all that criteria, and then if you are gluten free, then we have to make sure that uh, if you are not gluten free certified, then we have to make sure that your facility is gluten free safe. Yeah. You talk. Uh, you have like tea people. You talk a little bit more about tea and your company's culture. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, so my team has mostly women. Yeah. Um, one of the few companies in Silicon Valley are mostly women. Um, we have a sales team that does on close deals with our food company. Uh, five of the other five, a third of the team are engineers. They are front end, back end, um, and then sales, customer support, and social media. So, so that's how we split uh, responsibility. And um, in terms of culture, I like to keep it happy, fun. I used to work at PeopleSoft. I'm not sure if you guys. Remember. Because I'm not so young. <laughs> um, PeopleSoft has been voted like the best place to work in America for many, many years consecutive, consecutively. And if you don't work there, you won't understand. So I've been, I've worked there before, you know, and it intrigues me that for a company that is, has more than 10,000 people, it still feels like a family. Everyone cares for one another, and I make really good friends there. And that's when you know that the culture is right. And that actually was the one that company inspired me to build how the industry should be, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's a and I made it very right clear to everyone. Uh, one of the core values is no asshole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We do the same as we do for the conference. <laughs> no, no, we can say that also. <laughs> 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 Just no graphics. <laughs> what is your biggest challenge right now? Um, In other words, spreading the word, how can we help? Oh, I think right now is managing people. You know, the company grows, like it went from six people to 15 people within a few months. Mm -hmm. And that was, I would say, very challenging for me. And actually, it was a great experience to learn about myself. <laughs> what, what are my limits? Uh, managing people is like babysitting. And especially when someone like you will tell me, I don't get along with that person. You know, then I have to step in as the peacemaker. <coughs> Things like that I don't enjoy doing. It's also helped me realize what I like to do and what I don't like to do, what I'm strong at and what I'm not. I'm strong at building a company, I'm strong at building a culture, I'm strong at raising money. Peacemaker, I'm not strong at. <laughs> I'm just like, you guys don't get along, then don't talk to each other. <laughs> you know? But then you don't, only, you don't have a co founder, so he steps in. Me? You? <laughs> yeah, my uh, twin sister. So, um, so things like that, the HR things, I really don't. And it's bound to happen where your company grows, there will be conflict, right? Just like in any relationship, there will be conflict. People don't because when you're in a startup, everyone you hire is a type A personality. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to get things done. Everybody wants to build the company as fast as you can. But that also creates a different in definition, you know, a different in uh, how you <laughs> execute. At the end of the day, I will stamp my foot down and say, you know. Heard all your ideas. You might not agree with me, but this is what we're doing. You know. So that's the best way in a peacemaking situation. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then the rest of the things like HR things, like you know, payroll, health benefits. That's not bad. So are you in San Francisco or San Jose? Uh, our office is in Foster City. Okay. Yes, they can start options. Yeah. Yeah. They do. Are you 
your sales in the public business? Are you ready? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I should have numbers. Last year we made uh, a little bit more than $2 is the company going in for your predictions, expectations? Yes. Yeah, given, you know, I didn't, I mean, I raised two million, but I didn't, it's not that much, you know, as you, as you know, um, hiring is very expensive. But we managed to make it work, you know, like with salary, with how much we spend on advertising, we still managed to grow, and, uh, you know, and a lot of companies are coming to us now, so we're at, at a, we have grown to, to a scale where it's very fun. We can make demands. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think about exporting the concept outside the U.S.? Um, we thought about it, not at the right moment. You know, with uh, a lot of people have asked us to go to Canada uh, or even Europe. If we do that, we're cutting ourselves too too thin. We'll need to hire more people. You know, we'll need to do marketing in the country, which will need new funding. You know, so at this point, if I raise, you know, when I raise Series A, which is this year, I have to make sure that I raise it for the right reason. Um, whether we want to expand exponentially in the U.S. or we want to. Become What was the experience like having the first one and two, one or two people? Because that, that must have been interesting, right? Yeah. Story. That was like, should we do this? I don't know, we'll just do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, at that time, making decisions was very fast, quick like that, because, because you don't know, right? right? A lot of things is that you don't know until you try it. So it was, it was much easier. Um, but as a company girl, I have to give I can't make decisions as fast now because 15 people depends on my, my decision. I, whatever I make will affect 15 payrolls. So I have to think really hard before I make a big decision. Yeah. So, so do I miss that stage? I do miss that stage. Yeah. But there are other things that, good things that happen now. There are other things in that stage that I don't miss. So, you know, like nobody knows what who we were. Um, can you give a bit of insight on like how you kind of select a food company partners? Because the reason why I bring that up is that you know some of the food companies won't necessarily strategically align with a lot of kind of the uh, core elements of what the company's about, right. the nutrition and so forth. So how do you kind of balance you know with potentially using like customer information, but also with a company that's aligned to that? Uh, we only work with companies who believe in our model because one, a lot of companies want to work with us because we cut their sampling budget by 70%. So okay. we save them money, right? Yeah. And at the same time, we're collecting data. For companies to collect data on this scale, it's usually $50,000 to $100,000 cost. But for us, it's part of the process, right? So that's convincing <coughs> enough to most companies. The next thing is, their ingredients and products have to align with, with what we believe in. You know, if they have uh, stevia, we do not accept products with stevia. You know, uh, so things like that. Yeah. So let's say I open your box and I give it to my kids, and my kid like one snack. Mm -hmm. Where do I find that snack? You come back to local food and buy it. You lo which local? Oh, I yeah. see, I see. There's no, no indication where to go? Some of the things are not... The, the problem with solving is because the products are not... usually not sold in a local grocery store. Oh, I see. Yeah. Could you decide on the Virginia location for... North Carolina. North Carolina, sorry. It was highly recommended. We use a warehouse here in Fremont. As we grew, they couldn't scale with us. And um, and this fulfillment thing, you know, it, it's just in terms of cost-wise, it's just cheaper to outsource our state. And two, they are a huge logistic company, so they can negotiate a great shipping rate on our behalf. Yeah. So the moment we outsource to North Carolina, our cost actually came down to 
Which of the larger food companies would be interested in broadband business in Bulgaria? Are you just curious about the food space in Bulgaria? So Jaren Mills. So we work with Jaren Mills. We work, we work with Nestle. Mm -hmm. um, so we work with companies of all sizes. As long as the product is unique. So if you're Jaren Mills and you come to me and say, hey, I want you to put Cheerios in the box. I'm like, no, I'm not going to put Cheerios. Right. Everybody knows what Cheerios is, right? Or if you say, I want to put Oreos in the box. Um, so General Mills, um, Nestle, they have they have a healthy, they call it a better for you line of products, which is not as popular. Um, you know Stacy's chips. That's uh, I think that's owned by uh, Pepsi. Pepsi has also a line of product called Simply Simply Life, which is all better for you, but just nobody knows about it. Um, so the big companies have the right products for us. Um, and to answer your question, yeah, we work with Cliff Bar. So is, is your collaboration with the larger uh, corporations not undermining the interests of the smaller farmers and smaller manufacturers, the small business owners? Mm -hmm. Is because they can never match the capacity and Strictly artisanal, that's why you'll never find the word artisanal on our side. We work with products that are unique and not out there yet. So it doesn't matter if it's made by whether it's a small company or big company. We, as long as we know it fits our commercial criteria and the taste is good, we will accept the product. Yeah. But it's interesting because you know it's interesting to see how a small company product and a big company compete to one another. We don't put competing products together. So if you are if you're a chip company, we will not we'll never put two chips in the box. Really? Why though? It'll be great. No, no, no. No, no. Yeah, the food companies will be like that. They will like, I'm giving you a product for free and you're trying to shame us. So, yeah. yeah. So we won't we'll never do that. But what we've done recently was um, we the February box has a chip called, uh, it's made by Boulder Brands, and it's made with olive oil. It's really good. So what we did was we took that chip, and we took the original lace, you know, we went to the very building, and we asked people to do a blind test. And we did a, and we did a YouTube video of it. We asked people to say, hey, which one would you want to, would you like to try both and tell us which one you like? Boulder Brands won hands down. Nice. So our mission is also, to educate people that it's okay to snack, but you know we want to make sure that you choose the healthier option. Would you mind calling them mothers and telling them that snack? Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> okay to snack. Everyone snack. Nasty wants to everyone's mom. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Uh, I know that childhood obesity on a national level has kind yes. of been a big, big uh, concept coming up Washington and. I, I just kind of want some input on maybe what approaches or how you maybe uh, the company's been involved in any of the process or any of the plans? Uh, no, we, uh, our focus is on child hunger, on child obesity. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we want to keep things simple. We'll pick one battle to fight, and that's, that is okay. the one battle to fight. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Besides your day to day operations, like, is there anything that keeps you awake at night? Do you like being obsessed with expectations and the role? Is it, uh, I don't know, anything that competition? Yeah, everything. Everything, right? <laughs> Honestly, I can tell you, the moment you start your own business, you'll never sleep out. Ever again. And that is true. I will wake up with nightmares, you know, like even after I raise one to one point, I'll wake up like, oh, we're running out of money. You know, even when we still have a million dollars in the bank. I will panic. I think maybe because I worry easily. Uh, I'm not sure that that's good or bad. Um, but there are a lot of things that keep me awake. Like, you know, as the company grow, the problems will just multiply, you know, and, is, and, and it grows exponentially too. Because as the company grow, you want to make sure that the, the employees are being appreciated and motivated. Um, and the culture is 
still the way I want it. And as a company girl, the more expectation, right? Like some investors will say, oh wow, um, you made like 2013, you made a lot more six million. So next year, does that mean you made 10 million? You know, I'm like, I can't do that, you know, I can't promise that. If that happens, yeah, for everyone, right? But what I can promise you is maybe two times of that revenue. <coughs> uh, Thank you. That's true. Yeah. But things like that, you know, I, at the end of the day, the responsibility is, my biggest responsibility is what I have to make sure that I can make 50 payrolls, right? So whatever this recap makes, I have to make sure that no one's job get affected. And do they eat in the office every day, like Google? Or, I mean, do they eat on the site, your employees? I'm sorry, I can't Do they eat in the office? Do they or? eat in the office? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, most people eat in the office. So my office, we have a policy that we work in the office Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Tuesday, Thursday, everybody works from home. Oh. Yeah, and it's really great arrangement because one, I have people driving from Danville to Foster City, from Dublin to Foster City, San Francisco to Foster City. Foster City is great. I picked it because it's the middle for everyone. And because I live in San Mateo, so it's great for me. <laughs> um, oh, but driving is a pain in the ass, especially traffic, you know. So given that if you can work from home twice a week and it saves you at least an hour a day. And that one hour, you can go do something else, you know, play with your kids, go cook, go run, work more. Um, and I, I want to make sure that there's some work-life balance. How, is there, how has that worked out? Because there, there was some discussion in Silicon Valley with uh, Ms. Marissa Martyr saying, you know, working from home, uh, and then the other was used to. Uh, right. There was the beats and debated in the end of the life. So how did because I, I'm also a big proponent of like you know the, the industrial economy kind of like push the growth of the oil and the automobile sector by creating the downtowns and having people come here. So obviously now you're using the car and you're using the gas. That's how we build this country. They got these. But now things have changed. You know, so can we get you reconnected anywhere in the world? So it's always been the case for the last few years. How is that working out for the company, for your specific company? I think, I think for Yahoo is you. You have to hire the right people who can be disciplined enough to work at home. I think when Marissa Maya joined Yahoo, a lot of people she didn't hire them, right? And I think it was a great way to clean out. Yeah. <laughs> but she was trying to change the culture. She was trying to change the culture too. Yeah. So I think there was a lot of things that she has to change. She has a much bigger battle than me. Um, <laughs> for, for, for me, is I feel like at, in this day and age, you know, we're a technology company, a lot of things can be done via the internet. I really don't care where you are. If you're sitting on a beach, as long as you're Wi Fi, it can work. I don't care. Because at this point, I only want to hire people who can deliver, I don't care how they do it, as long as they meet a, meet a deadline, I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. um, we really enjoyed your story. Can you please define three key ingredients of your business model? Uh, sorry, I think. Can uh, you please uh, identify uh, three key ingredients of your business model? Key drivers? Yeah. Um, of Model. So we make money from everyone, <laughs> uh, from consumer, from brands, right? Uh, I would say the key driver for one for brands is because they don't have any other alternative. The other alternative is the old-fashioned way of giving out samples, right? <laughs> giving out samples where um, at Costco or Whole Foods. That's the traditional alternative, and we give them a brand new way to do it, and a more efficient way, a more cost-effective way. So that drives our b 2 business. For consumer, what drives the consumer business is, uh, one, the angle is healthier snacks. We're educating you to eat this and not that. And two, the word of mouth is very strong. One, one of the main uh, growth is word of mouth. Because once you get it, 
everyone's like, hey, um, they'll tell their friends. Or if they bring it to the office, everybody will start crowding, you know, um, around the cube and say, hey, what was that? Or we have, we, we even have parents, uh, like mom and daughters, who don't live together anymore, but they get the box. So once a month, they'll call each other and talk about the box. Um, so I would say the word of mouth is the other key driver for our B2C business. How about, how about, how about, you mentioned about your company, so they can be Yes. So how many engineers in your team? Five. Yeah. No, I don't call anymore. I boss people around. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah, I'm just like doing uh, my graduation right now. Okay. So, what will be kind of uh, like procedure for me uh, to get into these things, like like get into these groups, kind of, and be more knowledge, or just like start up? Uh, like if I have an idea, just start up and get to know the things about the course, or should I have some experience onto it and then start up a company? You want to start a company? Yeah, obviously. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I understand your yes. <laughs> um, I think, so you are graduating, yeah. right? What's your undergrad? Uh, computer science. Computer science. Yeah. Are you looking for a job? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're hiring, just so yeah. you know. Uh, if you want to do, work on a start, launch a startup, I would say work at one and also go to a lot of events to okay. meet people. Uh, events like that because I don't know if you ever uh, if you want a co-founder you know events like that usually bring the same like-minded people together mm -hmm. so that's a good start mm -hmm. um, working at the startup is good experience because yeah. you see the chaos and then when you do your own stuff you you tell yourself it's okay yeah. <laughs> it's normal yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean I it was chaotic the last three months and sometimes I wonder is it always that chaotic or is it just I'm not doing things right um, and then I read the book, uh, Hard Things About Hard Things, and then I calm down. <laughs> That's normal. I'm not the only one. Um, another great book that I read is called Startup CEO. Okay. Um, it, it also walks through the journey of a, because you're only a startup CEO once. If you do a second company again, you're no longer a first time startup yeah. CEO. So that book gave me a lot of insight to what to expect when you're a first-time CEO, mm -hmm. that chaos is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had uh, we had uh, one uh, speaker from Pinterest actually, mm -hmm. and uh, he was the first full-time employee of Pinterest oh, wow. in point number five. Uh, and one of the things that he mentioned that Ben Silverman and his co-founder they actually met at meetup. Oh, they met at meetup. The first, the, the co-founders of Pinterest. I know for one guy's name, Ben Silverman. Uh, the other guy I forgot his name. But they met at a meetup. Oh, they met at a meetup. They met at a meetup. That's how they started. I So, so you never underestimate, like you know, uh, why are you saying when uh, you know you can meet like-minded people there? You can, the next day, I personally hear stories because I bring. Um, People together on this, uh, you know, platform. So I've heard stories from a lot of uh, just the other way. Somebody, you know, like we, we launched a startup. You know, we we're going through the fundraising round and all. Just yesterday. So we it definitely does happen. So and you guys, that's why you guys are out and about uh, going to these events. It does happen. Yes. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about um, the early part of your story when you changed from the Groupon type model yeah. to the other model and then. The kind of two-part question. Second part is, it seems like um, early on when you changed to the new model, you weren't um, making any revenue. Nope. Um, so how long did you, you know, stay like that? How was that experience for you? And I don't know. So, um, so the first model was the Groupon model, right? And then I was able to get great uh, food companies to sell their product on, on liquid food at 50% off, you know, like this, uh, artisan marshmallow maker. She makes like mango marshmallow so good. And no matter how great the photo is or how well you describe it, people are hesitant to try. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I would just so I ask I'll ask people, you know, like why are you not buying? Ask your customers. 
I was asked a customer, do you do share a lot of stories? More than you want to know. Um, and a lot of people had that feedback, like, I, I just want to try a little bit before I want to buy, you know. And then, at the, that week, the same weekend, I went to farmer's market, and I see people giving out samples too. Then I realized that at that moment, I had an epiphany, when it comes to food, people really need to try. Just like makeup. That's why makeup is doing really well in the subscription and commerce space. Uh, so that gave me, that at that moment, I know we need to change. Uh, and then, of course, sending out samples, right? At that time, nobody knows what local food is. Where am I going to get all this food product and put it in a box? Literally, I literally, we just went out and buy products and put it in a box. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we did. Um, and, and the first month was just giving out boxes to bloggers to write about us. And I also invited, I spam all my friends to sign up. Mm -hmm. And it was, the first box that went out was before Christmas. It was a soft launch, it wasn't public. So I tell everyone, it's Christmas, let's do something good for a friend, buy a loaf of food box. <laughs> I said, you know, you know, I never ask for any favor, but I need I need you to buy a loaf of food box because at that time it was December, right? And at the end of 500 startups, there is a demo day where you have to do the dog and pony show to show your great awesome numbers for investors. So February was the demo day, and I had no numbers to show. So I was literally telling all my friends and their friends to buy them for us. So there was an income. I mean, the first month we had about 100 subscribers, which is not bad for one month. Um, but we also sold the box at like a half price. We were making a loss. Yeah. So when you are starting, you be prepared to make a loss. Yeah. Yes. I, I know. Oh, you. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, long day. Um, I know you mentioned that you're focused a lot on the U.S. Uh, right now. Yes. But I guess because we're kind of getting to the point that a lot of food trends are becoming global. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure. Like, how do you kind of go about identifying the next big thing, so to speak, if it's kind of outside of like the country, or like, do you still have people scoping up kind of what's happening? In other regions are going to come here in the next six months? Interesting like, enough, a lot of food, in the, a lot of stuff in the U.S. are made in the U.S. Um, they may get some inspiration overseas, but at the end of the day, it's still made in the U.S. One thing is, in the food business, I have no The biggest enemy is FDA. So every country, like when you ask me if we have plans to go overseas, it's not as easy because other countries have a different set of FDA laws, and over here, you know, if if, if people want to import food from overseas, and it goes through FDA, you have to go through the port, you know, and it's a very long, long process. So I mean, we don't to go back to our question. We don't really spot trends. We go to food, we go to uh, food shows. We'll see interesting stuff, like uh, you know, coconut water, right? Yeah. The next thing. Is artichoke water? Yeah, artichoke water. Okay. You need to pressure, right? But it's not it's not the next big thing yet. But it's it's up and coming. Okay. Yeah. So we go to food shows to see all these things that are up and coming. But but in order to get a product to gain attention, it needs a lot of money, a lot of money. Yeah. So we don't know yet if artichoke water will be the next. Because I'm digging a bit on that because I actually work for Health Canada, Canada. So that's kind of my perspective. I think there's a lot of business value in Canada as well. So I hope you come to Canada. I, I hope so too. I hope so too. We've been reading up the FDA rules and regulations for Canada because we can start sending boxes and just ignore until one day I get a phone call from the Canadian government like, hey, you can just send food across the border. I'm like, oops, I didn't know. Um, we could do that. But, you know, the country is big enough that we, we want to make sure we do the right thing. Yeah. Did you find out that different ethnic groups like different snacks? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like seaweed. People didn't like seaweed. <laughs> no, I mean, do you, you try to send maybe something more spicy to a group or something more sweet to another group? I don't know how this... Uh, no, we don't. 
it's everybody. Moment, but in the future, we will let you choose two items out of eight. Oh, two out of eight. I yeah. see. Yeah. So th is that something that people have asked for? And it was so funny. We like we ask we tell people, do you want to choose entirely what for the entire month, or do you just want to choose a few things like few. you know two or three things, majority, and or do you just not want to choose? You just want to surprise me. Oh. I am surprised that people, majority is either I just want to surprise or I just want to choose two things or three things. Nobody wanted the the whole thing. Choose, yeah, mm -hmm. it ruins the surprise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How many different products do you ship in a month? It, uh, oh no, because we have three different boxes. We have the, this is the smallest uh, tasting. We have deluxe, which is three, three times the size. And then we have gluten free. So every month we probably send out about 35 different products. Inside? Inside all three boxes, yeah. At least 35 different products. But then you try to keep changing there with a bit of time. We keep it fresh. Like, hey, the people that are buying are from New York. 
So he took that sales data, saying, hey, this is how much New Yorkers love our product. Mm. And uh, this is the sales evidence at Love Food. So that was how we helped him to get into, to convince some New York uh, customers, uh, buyers to carry his product. Why would, what's the incentive for someone to buy from your website and not directly? We have free shipping. <laughs> <laughs> and it's usually cheaper on our site. Do you have any competitors? Um, yeah, we do have a couple. I mean, we had Walmart. I'm not sure if you guys know Walmart launched Goodies.co a few years ago. And also NatureBox. Yeah, NatureBox is not really a close competitor. The closest one was Walmart. It scared me because yeah. you know their box is twice the size and seven dollars. <laughs> And you know, good old fashioned Walmart is, I'll compete with you based on price, right? And and I refuse to reduce our price less than 10 because what we send is really high quality products. Um, and Walmart competed with us very fiercely too, for two years. At the end of the second year, I got a call from them. They said, hey, do you want to buy our customers? Um, yeah, so this was a secret acquisition that happened that we couldn't talk about it. Yeah. Um, so we acquired them in 2013. Yeah, they had a lot of issues. They couldn't, as I said, it goes back to anything subscription is surprise and delight. If you cannot deliver that, your churn will be really high. And for that, we get the Walmart box. We just want to see what they said. <laughs> oh my gosh, you get, you get, you get Cheetos in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> in Spanish, not even in English. And then you get Nutella. <laughs> Things like that. So it's things that you see at Safeway, you know, it's like why why wanna it's not delightful, it's not surprising. Yeah, right? What would be a potential acquisition? Um you being acquired as an answer. I would say probably Amazon. It would be natural because they are experimenting with so many different angles and they really want to get food working. They're keeping an eye out for you. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, one of one the the very first engineer, full time engineer at Amazon is our investor. Yeah. So yeah, so that he he invested because he said he he reminded him a lot of Amazon in the very beginning. Yeah. So so that's why he wrote the chat. Yeah. So that was that was good. Um, yeah, going back to your nature box. Nature box, they send private label stuff. Um, it's all nature box. I call nature box Trader Joe's in a box. Also, oh, if it's all private label, it's all private label. Ah, yeah, it's not like oh, you see different brands made by different people. So that's a, that's how we're different. But what well, subscription? And it doesn't that doesn't let them serve the whole data part of the back business. No, they can't do yeah, that they can't because they, by doing private label, they shut they themselves can't. out. Yeah. Oh, so they shut themselves out. Well, they are very big. I mean, they raised $28 million oh, wow. for a food company. Yeah. The uh, founder used to be a venture capitalist. Uh, yeah. They're doing well. Yeah. With the uh, loving food that works by, in the sense, like just cheese box, just chips box, or just fruit. We may go into things like dairy free, peanut free, I mean we already have gluten free. Um, yeah, but I don't think we'll go into the just cheese and vegetable. Yeah. Well, yeah, because well, there are other that that. Like high performance food for them, I'm not happy. I want just snacks for more exercise. Right. Do you have like a box specifically for me or? No, not right not now. Bad. Yeah, right. not right now. That's your style. <laughs> 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 if the concept is good and the business model it seems to be working in the market, yeah, there's there's space for more players, I guess, you know. If, I mean, if, right, that's how Snapchat and all those right. Tinders and Tinders and God knows all, because there's a need in the market and there's there's a need on the phone, you know, and and. and I I be too busy focusing on her core competency and then other players jump in. Yeah. 
Okay. So, she has a limit of thirty-five dollars that you ship with. I imagine it must be like other people in the waiting list that wants to ship like that. this month. I want my product this this month. By right. same name, you can absorb more of these people that are waiting. You mean like two companies? Yeah, yeah, your 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 customers that yeah. want to ship the those bags. Yeah, we we solved that, um, but it's just a lot of coordination has to go into it, like. You know, like recently we split the U.S. pack into four quadrants because one box, one small box, you can only uh, feature eight to ten products, right? And what we did was we split into four different regions. Um, that way, we can feature forty different products instead of just eight. Yeah, and but that requires a lot of coordination. A lot of people, you know. It's funny when I started a business, everybody thinks it's so easy to start a subscription business, just throw a bunch of things in a box and ship it. I'm not sure, go try. I'm not scared of you, try. After three months, I'm pretty sure you'll give up. <laughs> yeah. So how many subscribers do you have now? Can't have yeah. Next try. <laughs> it, did you say 10,000? No, I said I can't tell you. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, you, you said if you are, do the math. He said yeah. three million dollars yeah, sale. That's but yeah. no, that's not just no. But a bunch of her income comes from the data she sells to the person. Yeah. And and you have been around how long? Three years. Three. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty good growth. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned a few books that would be helpful for like entrepreneurs and people that are interested, as well as kind of like online resources like the way do you use like Hootsuite like. What type of kind of resources and tools do you think like maybe early stage entrepreneurs should really kind of look into that can really grow a business? Maybe at like very early stage. To, to grow a business for social media? Um, to... Well, I, I think social media as well as are there any other like online resources that you think maybe if you had started with at the beginning of your company are very, very useful now for like entrepreneurs right. and people that want to be entrepreneurs? Hootsuite was Hootsuite is very very popular and I've used Hootsuite since the very beginning because it helped me manage posting things from Twitter and uh, Facebook at the same time. I mean in the beginning I'm the social media manager. Um, so for for that Hootsuite was very uh, helpful. Until today we still use it. Okay. Yeah. Is yeah. this the best platform you would say? Yes. We've tried others, it's just not as not as useful, especially if you add more people on the team, you want to give them access to do the, you know, to share one who's with account. Um, that that's still the easiest. Yeah. And then of course after that, you know, the other software like what should we use for CRM, what should we use for um, email newsletter, things like that. I have to figure it out. So right now we use um, Mailchimp um, and for CRM we use. Uh, capsule. We tried. What did we try? We tried Salesforce. It was too complicated and expensive. Now we tried uh, Zocdoc. Yeah, and Hesitant. That was very clunky. Uh, and we've been using Capsule for a year. I think the last two years now. Yeah. Thanks. Nice to get out. We're going to wrap this up. We really appreciate, obviously, uh, my name. This was so amazing, really. Uh, oh, thank you for your time. Yeah, it was like, so insightful. And uh, you know, you can see by the engage how engaged the, the, the participants were. So uh, if you hang around, you know, you'll have a chance to please meet them. I really appreciate you.